Takeoff involves setting loads of power, going really, really fast and pulling back at just the right moment to take the aircraft into the air. Simple, right? Well, let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the fifth class in the performance series. Today we're going to be taking a look at the takeoff procedure and what sort of performance parameters we need to achieve in order to do this maneuver safely. The takeoff is the segment of the flight right at the beginning. It starts when the aircraft begins to accelerate down the runway until the aircraft has left the ground and cleared something which we call the screen height. The screen height is basically this imaginary wall and the lowest part of the aircraft has to clear this imaginary wall. And the lowest part of the aircraft usually is either the main gear or the tail of the aircraft as we rotate up. And for class A operations, think like jets, the screen height is 35 foot high and for class B, small piston propeller type things, it's 50 foot high. We can also split the takeoff into two sections, the takeoff run and the takeoff distance. The takeoff distance is the total distance from the start of acceleration to clearing the screen height and the takeoff run is the part basically where the wheels are on the ground and it will end as soon as the main landing gear starts to come off the ground as we rotate the aircraft and apply back pressure to the controls to pitch up. We begin this rotation at uh, VR speed, speed for rotate, and when the wheels actually come off the ground, that would be VLOF, V lift off. These V speeds will be an assigned indicated airspeed depending on the weight and the environmental conditions. And whilst we fly these speeds at the indicated values that we can actually see on our instruments and dials, the speed of rotate and lift off actually are all to do with the lift equation and therefore the true airspeed. So the true airspeed is what's important, but when we are at slow speeds, the indicated airspeed is roughly equivalent to the uh, equivalent airspeed, and there's the relationship between equivalent airspeed of and true airspeed of a uh, true airspeed multiplied by the square root of the density versus the density at sea level. What that actually means is, say we are at an airport that's above sea level, where the density would be less then for the same indicated airspeed at sea level, the true airspeed would actually be faster. That means that the air traveling over the wings is faster, and to get the air traveling over the wings faster, we've got to go faster down the runway, using up more distance to do so. If we put some numbers into this equation, for example, and say we needed an indicated airspeed or equivalent airspeed of 150 knots um, for takeoff at sea level then if we're at sea level, we know that the true airspeed is going to be basically 150 knots as well, because that will equate to one, square root of one is one. But if we go up to where the density is maybe only one kilogram per uh, meter cubed, and then divide that by the sea level ISA of 1.225, then this basically comes out to be 0.9. So, 150 knots equals TAS times 0.9, the true airspeed will have to be higher, and that means that the true airspeed is actually 167 knots, meaning we have to travel faster and we'll cover more of the runway, have a longer takeoff run and takeoff distance as a result of this increase in altitude. That's just one of the factors that influence the takeoff distance and takeoff run, and now we'll have a look at a few more. Mass is quite a simple environmental factor or physical factor that's easy to understand. We basically need more lift to get the aircraft into the air because we are heavier. Therefore, if we don't change anything else, we want to fly a faster speed. To get to this faster speed, we need to cover more of the runway and we'll increase the takeoff roll and the takeoff distance required as a result. And as we increase the mass more and more and more, we extend the takeoff distance required up to the point where we have no runway left. Or, in other words, our takeoff distance is equal to the takeoff distance available. Then we would have a value for our takeoff mass that we'd be limiting. We wouldn't be able to add any more mass or we wouldn't have enough runway to accelerate up to the required speed that we need for takeoff we would call this limiting mass our runway limited takeoff mass, our RLTOM. It's sometimes referred to as the field limiting takeoff mass, 
um, which would apply for the flap setting that we currently have for takeoff. By changing the flaps, we basically increase the camber of the wing and surface area so we can achieve more lift for flying at a slower speed. That means that we don't need to accelerate as much to achieve the required lift that we need. And that would reduce the takeoff distance down because we don't need to accelerate up to that higher speed. And we could reduce it back down to below the TODA if we were approaching the maximum takeoff distance that was available. This means that we would have the opportunity to add a bit more mass because then we have room to accelerate a bit faster up to a higher speed to generate enough lift to take care of that max so that the takeoff distance again equals the takeoff distance available. This is basically why we use flaps during takeoff and why we have a different uh, runway limited takeoff mass for each different flap setting. It allows for a lower liftoff speed compared to an aircraft without flaps, therefore allowing us to take off heavier, extending back out the takeoff distance. And we like to take off heavier because usually that means more bags, more passengers, uh, and that's paid for space and it makes us some money. Flaps increase the camber and surface area of the wing, but they also increase drag beyond a certain level. So there's kind of a sweet spot for flap use where the added drag doesn't reduce the amount of acceleration too much whilst giving us that added benefit of lift, that uh, reduced acceleration speed, the potential to extend it out and take more weight. Increasing altitude and more importantly, a reducing density makes the truer speed for the equivalent indicated airspeed we need to take off faster and we cover more runway. That's what I was talking about at the very start. A lower density also means we have a reduction in thrust. Remember uh, that lower density is bad for thrust generation because engines are all about mass acceleration. If we have a lower thrust, that means a slower acceleration. And the reason behind it is basically because F equals MA. Uh, if we rearrange it, then A equals F over M. The forces during takeoff are thrust minus drag. If we have less thrust, then this whole number is gonna be lower. And that means that our acceleration rate will be lower as well. If you combine that with the indicated airspeed versus true airspeed problem, then we can be quite limited on higher aerodromes. And these limits will always come in the form of a weight limit. So for higher aerodromes, we would have a lower regulated uh, runway limited takeoff mass than at an airport at sea level, for example. Temperature is a very similar story to altitude. Temperature reduces air density and therefore we have less thrust produced, less less excess thrust and again a lower acceleration. This has the same effect as with altitude, a longer takeoff distance or a lower runway limited takeoff mass. The increase in temperature reducing the density also has the same effect uh, for true airspeed versus indicated airspeed. The true airspeed will be higher than the indicated airspeed. So when we're flying at certain indicated airspeed for takeoff, the true airspeed is actually going to be higher. We're going to need to cover more runway to accelerate up to that, especially when combined with our lower acceleration rate. Um, it can be pretty bad and pretty restrictive for our runway limited takeoff mass. And if you combine a high up aerodrome with a hot aerodrome, it can get really bad and really limiting quite fast. A headwind is good for takeoff because the wind actually passing over the wings, the true airspeed of the air over the wings, will be higher than the speed of the moving aircraft. Say we had a 10 knot headwind, for example, then before we even start moving, the wings have 10 knots of air passing over them. And we accelerate down the runway, we still have this added 10 knots. So if we needed to achieve a true airspeed of 150 knots, then when we're actually traveling at 140 knots, the wings have that added 10 knots passing over them. And that means that they have the desired true airspeed of 150 knots, and that means we've covered less distance as we go down the runway. Tailwind would be the opposite. We would need to accelerate more to counteract the reduction in airflow over the wings. So say the 10 knots is now a tailwind, at 150 knots ground speed, we wings would only have 140 knots um, of air passing over them. So we'd need to actually accelerate all the way to 160 knots on the ground before the wings get that 150 knots true airspeed that they need for takeoff, we'd basically use more runway to accelerate up to that speed, therefore needing a longer takeoff distance, 
and our limit would be lower as a result. For wind, we factorize the number that we use for head or tailwind, basically to be conservative. Wind is a bit unpredictable and it gusts and changes directions. Uh, so we only use 50% of the headwind component because we don't want to be too reliant on the wind. Uh, we don't want to take too much extra weight because of we've got a really strong headwind. And for tailwind, we multiply the component by 1.5, take 150% of it so that we overestimate its power and therefore don't underestimate the strength of it. And we don't take more weight that we can handle with an added gust of wind. Winds are rarely straight down the runway, so we have to break the wind into the component parts using trigonometry to figure out the headwind and the crosswind component. We basically use the difference in angle between the runway and the wind. Then we multiply by sine theta to get the cross component. And if we multiply by cosine theta, we get the head or tailwind component, which I'll show an example now. At LEAL, Alicante, what runway would you use for takeoff and what wind component would you use for takeoff when the ATIS wind is 250 at 30 degrees? So the runways at Alicante are either runway 10 if you're landing in an easterly direction or runway 28 if you're landing in the westerly direction. And the exact directions are 280 and 100, which is very useful for this example. We know headwind is good. So naturally the wind that is pointing coming from the direction which favors 28 makes sense. So 250 means the wind's coming from about here. So we're going to land into the wind. So we're going to use runway 28. Nice and easy. The difference between the angles of runway 28 and runway and the wind 250 at 30 is 30 degrees. To calculate the crosswind, we do uh, we use the sine of the angle because it equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. So if we do 30 knot wind multiplied by sine 30, we would get the crosswind component. So the crosswind component is sine 30 is uh, half. So it's going to be 15 knots. Um, and the headwind component, we do 30 times cosine theta, which is 30 degrees. So headwind component, if you calculate this out, it basically comes out as 26 knots which seems a bit weird. How can the two components make up more than the wind itself? Um, that's just trigonometry, I'm afraid. It's quite strange like that. So we've got a headwind of 26 knots, but remember, we only use 50% of that. So the component that we'd actually use is 30 knots. So we're on runway 28, and we're considering the headwind to be 30 knots for our takeoff calculations. So there are certain runway characteristics themselves that are very useful for us during takeoff. Obviously, a long runway is good for takeoff. If it's really long, we can get to a weight limit for takeoff that is actually above our structural limit for our aircraft. So say we calculated using the takeoff all the takeoff distance available with current temperature and pressure and flap setting, our weight limit for takeoff, our runway limit to takeoff mass was 8,000 kilograms. If our aircraft had a maximum structural limit, an MTOM, a max takeoff mass, of 7,500 kgs, then obviously we're not going to be able to take 8,000 kgs as limited by the runway. So we use the more restrictive one and we'd actually only be able to take the 7,500 kgs. And this is what we would call our regulated takeoff mass, which is our RTOM. You might also see runway limited as field limited, you might see it as uh, performance limited. So it might be P uh, T O M, for example. So if the runway is sloping up, then there's a weight component of the aircraft pulling us down the slope. So we need to use a bit more thrust to counteract it. This um, thrust that we're using to counteract the weight means there's less excess thrust available, which means a lower acceleration, more time to get up to speed, longer takeoff distance, and a lower uh, runway limited takeoff mass. Downslopes would be the reverse of this. We have the weight helping us pull us down the slope and accelerating us along the runway. And if the runway is contaminated with water or snow or even things like grass, then that can cause the wheels to spin and also the surface has a lot more resistance or wheel drag, which basically adds to the total drag of the aircraft, therefore reducing the excess thrust that's available.
slowing the acceleration and basically if we slow the acceleration we increase the takeoff distance we're just going to spend longer getting up to our takeoff speed and reduces the runway limited takeoff mass as a result okay to summarize then the takeoff run is from where we start to accelerate until the wheels leave the ground the takeoff distance then continues on until we pass the screen height this imaginary wall which is 35 feet high for class a operations and for class b it's 50 feet high we start to rotate at VR and we take off at VLOF. These speeds are flown as indicated airspeeds, but it's actually the true airspeed that is important. And as soon as we leave uh, sea level and change our altitude up, the density drops, which means that our indicated airspeed versus our true airspeed, there's a difference. The true airspeed's higher. So when we're flying at 150 knots indicated airspeed, it's actually a lot higher true airspeed meaning we've got to accelerate more and we cover more of the runway as we do that. Mass it basically is uh, restrictive for our takeoff distance. The more mass we have, the more lift we need. Then if we keep all the factors, other factors the same, we have to increase our takeoff speed in order to cover this lift. And um, as we accelerate more, we cover more of the runway and yeah we use up more of it basically so we will be restricted by a mass a maximum mass that we can take if we extended out our takeoff distance all the way up to the maximum takeoff distance available for that runway by using flaps we can increase the surface area and the coefficient of lift of the wing therefore allowing us to fly a slower speed for takeoff with the same amount of mass or in practice it means that we can basically extend back out our restrictive takeoff distance for whatever mass we have and that gives us a bit more buffer that we can then use to add more mass on increase the takeoff distance again and yeah get more money for the job basically altitude means that we have a lower density of air and less thrust and slower acceleration as a result and we also have the problem of the indicated airspeed versus the true airspeed um, we get higher true airspeed for the same indicated airspeed, so we cover more runway accelerating up to that true airspeed. Temperature is the same sort of thing. It's all about a lower density, same problems, lower thrust, lower acceleration, and the true airspeed's a lot higher for whatever indicated airspeed we are flying. Wind component is good. It helps us if it's a headwind because we already have a little bit of wind traveling over the um, air to give us a bit of true airspeed for the wing. Um, and the tailwind would be bad, it would be the reverse situation. We need to counteract that wind that's going the wrong way by accelerating a bit more up to our takeoff speed of 150 knots, let's say. Because of the gusty, unpredictable nature, we use 150% of the tailwind components, so we are more restrictive, and the headwind we only use 50% of so that we're not using the wind too much, we're not relying on the wind too much. We would have to calculate the wind component using trigonometry, sine theta multiplied by the wind equals the crosswind and if we do cosine theta it would equal the headwind or indeed the tailwind uh, some runway characteristics to consider a really long runway might not be restrictive at all for your runway limited takeoff mass so you might reach the structural limits first and that way you have to basically use the lower of the two because you're not going to fly over your maximum structural limit and if your runway limited takeoff mass was less then you're obviously not going to go up to the structural limit because you wouldn't be able to take off with that weight added on. So you take the most restrictive of either the structural or the runway limited, and that gives you your regulated takeoff mass. Other things to consider with runways are sort of the texture of the runway and any slope. If it's uh, covered in contamination, if it's icy, if it's got water on it, it's going to be worse because the wheels can spin and there's just less friction for the grip of the tires. Um, and any slope, if it's an upslope, the thrust therefore has to counteract a bit of the weight and there's less thrust for acceleration. And uh, yeah, it would take longer to get up to speed.